Hello and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series. I'm Stacey Roman and I will be moderating this discussion today. Due to scheduling conflicts, Seth Fransman, Executive Director of the Middle East Center for Reporting and Analysis and a writing fellow here at the Middle East Forum is unable to join us live, but we were able to record his lecture on the impact of Azerbaijan's drones on modern warfare. Dr. Fransman's pre-recorded lecture and answers to questions will run just over 30 minutes. Unfortunately we, are, unfortunately, we are unable to take live questions for this webinar. And with that, I'll begin Dr. Seth Fransman's lecture. Azerbaijan and Armenia recently engaged in a conflict that lasted several months, basically most of October. And then there was a few days in November and the Russians have come in now with some sort of peacekeeping force there's a lack of clarity a bit, but basically I think what we saw is that there was a clash between Azerbaijan and Armenia, and specifically in an area called Nagorno-Karabakh, which is a disputed area that is technically, according to international law, what have you, is part of Azerbaijan. So in fact, the fighting all took place within what is ostensibly the borders of Azerbaijan, actually not inside Armenia, although the forces involved were the Armenian-backed forces of this Artsakh Republic, which included um, basically a lot of uh, old style, or let's say different layers of uh, conventional military forces. So that would be mostly tanks, armored vehicles, uh, towed or artillery, uh, infantry units, not a lot of air power was used, I don't think, on the Armenian side. So that's kind of what we have. And then on the Azerbaijan side, and I think the point of this conversation, it will be why the military clash there is really interesting and what it means for warfare. So when the, when the clashes began, I don't think anyone thought that Azerbaijan and Armenia, why would these countries play such a role in the future of warfare? I mean, who's, not, not to be rude, but I mean, globally, who's really heard of Azerbaijan and Armenia in terms of military technology, when we talk about military technology, we talk about America, right? F-35s. We're talking about S-400s from, from Russia. We're talking about, you know, whatever China's massive drone armies or whatever they're building, right? We're talking about a very powerful, mostly very super modern, mostly many Western states building the best military stuff in the world. And of course, we're sometimes talking about Israel because Israel has some of the really great cutting edge technology in terms of military stuff, right? Israel builds the Iron Dome air defense system. Israel makes the trophy, which goes on American tanks. Um, Israel makes the helmets, by the way, that are flown by F-35 pilots. So Israel is obviously one of the contenders in terms of one of the greatest military industrial complexes globally. And Israel's three largest defense manufacturers, Rafael, IAI, and Elbit Systems, are some of the largest defense companies in the world. Uh, so with there, that being said, Therefore, when you think of Azerbaijan, I mean, we don't think of countries that are certainly building anything interesting in terms of military technology. However, what's really interesting is that within the last, say, months or so, in October especially, a war that began on the ground and looked to be basically an old-style infantry-style warfare with some tanks and, and soldiers running along uh, quickly became a war that I think has defined a bit of the future of warfare and is not fully understood or recognized. So why that matters i think is interesting the armenia first of all lost the conflict and most of the reason i think they lost at least it looks like in terms of what we've seen on videos by the way there's a very a big lack of reporting in terms of factual information uh, on the ground there so it's hard to judge from the azerbaijan side by the way azerbaijan restricted a lot of journalists even though it was trying to get of course western support azerbaijan since the 90s has tried to drift away from the kind of former Soviet bloc and become much closer to Turkey and the United States and Israel. So that's important to understand this context. Azerbaijan's military was revolutionized a bit by purchasing Israeli military technology. Now, and Turkish, uh, Turkish drones especially, and Israeli drones, which we'll come to in a second. Armenia is a bit of the opposite story. Armenia is a very poor, very isolated country. Of course, historically, Armenians have been a persecuted people and have suffered grievously. Now, Armenia, because of the conflict in the 90s, they actually won a conflict with Azerbaijan and were able to occupy this area of Nagorno-Karabakh, which is the whole kind of source of the conflict somehow, which is that Nagorno-Karabakh was an Armenian area, but it was an autonomous region in Azerbaijan and then occupied by Armenian forces. So it's one of those 
kind of typical post-Soviet things. You get similar to the Balkan Wars or something, where you have an area like Kosovo that has Albanians, but it's part of Yugoslavia and Serbia, etc. We don't need to go into all the details, but that's that's the reason the clash happened. And also, that means that the forces that Armenia deployed there, because Armenia was relying much more on Russian military technology, because Russia and Armenia were relatively close. Armenia's armed forces, let's say, looked a lot more like a kind of post-Soviet style, uh, Russian style uh, military. And I think uh, in compared to the actual revolution that has taken place among the actual Russian army in terms of the Russia's army and paratroops and things, Armenia's army stagnated a lot. It seems like it didn't have a lot of money. So when they went into the conflict, they had certainly a lot of military hardware on paper, but this is a bit like Saddam's army in 1990 against the Americans. Saddam's army was a huge, massive conventional force. It had you know, thousands of tanks or something. And you say, well, the, well, geez, this looks like you know, what the Germans put into France in 1940. Yeah, it looks like that on paper. But in terms of military technology, just like what happened in 1990, where the US Air Force in a bombing campaign of about 30 days totally destroyed Saddam's massive army. Um, and made it a kind of paper tiger. I mean, tragically for the Armenians in this sense, it's kind of what happened to them. And why this happened is really interesting because Azerbaijan, as we said in the beginning, you know, it, had, it, it did try to get closer to the West. But at the end of the day, Azerbaijan was not buying massive amounts of F-16s. It's, it's not buying F-35s. It's it basically what Azerbaijan invested in, but very intelligently, was a lot of drones. Now, when you think of drones, we tend to think of the drone wars in the, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. We think of the Predator drone, which is the America's premier product. Um, Predator drone is not particularly fast. And when, you built, when they built the later versions of it, like the Reaper drones, they basically added a lot more munitions to it, right? So it has more Hellfire missiles. But again, you know, what does that mean? It's a, it's a big, it's a drone. It looks like a plane, kind of. It's a kind of slow moving plane. It's got a bunch of missiles. It can use them to do precision targeted airstrikes, which is what the United States, of course, became famous or infamous for in places like Pakistan, which is a kind of clandestine drone war in which you use drones. Basically, what you do is you have, you're looking for a terrorist. The terrorist is in a house, uh, you know, some Al Qaeda or whatever, a Taliban type, and, or in a cave or something. And you have the drones flying around in circles, waiting for a long time. And you wait until some indication on the ground indicates that this guy has left the office. So a Toyota truck pulls up, a van pulls up, they go in different directions, and then you bring in another drone and you hit, you hit the Toyota truck with a missile, and you hope that you didn't hit a wedding party, but you hit an actual terrorist. So that's kind of what the US drone war has looked like, which is precision targeting and very slow kind of style of warfare because you can sit for three or four days or a month over a target and just wait for the opportunity to take place. Now, what the Azerbaijanis did is totally different. What they did was they didn't purchase, well, they couldn't purchase these big, uh, large American armed drones like Predators um, or Reapers because the US doesn't sell them to anyone. What they did do was they purchased a type of drone, which is not really a drone. It's a, what they call a loitering munition, sometimes called a suicide drone, uh, sometimes called a kamikaze drone. So those three terms are a bit inter interchangeable, but the technical term is loitering munition. Well, when you think of that, what those words mean is it loitering means it can sit around and loiter. And munition means it's a, it's a, it's a munition, actually. It's not a drone. It's actually just a missile. Um, it, what it means is you've got the, the, the technology, which is the, the, the basically like a cruise missile, or actually not that different than a German V-1 rocket of the, of the, of the, of the, first, the Second World War, which is basically um, you know, a small missile that looks like, kind of like a plane. It can fly around. But in this sense, it can loiter because it's kind of like a drone. But when it decides to kill something or finds a target, it is the missile. So it doesn't drop a missile, it just slams into the target, which actually seems totally logical, right? I mean, isn't it, you know, instead of, you have, instead of having a tank with a bunch of guys in it, why don't you just pack the tank full of explosives and, and put a remote control on it and drive the tank into the other guy's tank? I mean, it seems logical. And by the way, throughout history, there's been lots of examples of people doing things like that, for instance, during the Spanish Armada, the Spanish Armada was famously defeated partly by the British by using fire ships where they packed ships full of munitions and just slammed them into the thing. So it's not like ISIS, by the way, did that. They would pack uh, cars full of explosives, armor the car and put a suicide driver in it and the guy would just drive into the enemy line. Uh, of course, that requires that you have people that are willing to kill themselves. Well, when it comes to military technology these days, you don't need to have a kamikaze pilot, by the way, which the Japanese 
used very well in the Second World War. What you do is you just have a robot, which is the drone. You put the propeller on it, uh, and you have the drone hunt for targets of opportunity. Well, in a, in a battlefield in which your enemy is using um, basically artillery that's not even disguised, no camouflage or nothing, and you have a bunch of uh, tanks, um, to be honest, a drone can find that. And then you just hit those things one at a time. Now, you just need a lot of these missiles or these drones. So what the, what the Azerbaijanis did was they purchased a whole multi-layered system of Israeli technology, um, including, I think, the Sky Striker drone, which is from Elbit Systems, the Harpy and the Harup drones, which are from IAI. And I think also Aeronautics uh, builds a certain type of the several layers of drones, one of which is a Lloyd Ammunition and I think that's public information that basically, in some cases, Azerbaijan bought so many of these things that they had a kind of um, licensing agreement to build some of the products there. Uh, not, so if you, look, if you Google around online, you'll find various cases in which there's, you know, 2008 or 2016 or something, you'll see, oh, the first time that this type of drone was used or some controversy about how Azerbaijan had, you know, used this drone to demonstrate its effectiveness. From Israel's point of view, uh, the sales of these drones is very sensitive. It's not entirely secretive, but Israel does not brag about all of the weapons it sells. Um, of course, Israel tends to talk openly about weapon sales or collaboration with the U.S., like Iron Dome systems. Iron Dome is a defensive system. Israel doesn't talk as much about uh, its loitering munitions, but it's not a secret that Israel builds them because you can go to the, you can go to the company website and you can see that they, they, what they do. So they have videos online. Uh, what's interesting about Israel's drones, and, and Israel is, I think, one of the most proficient, actually probably the most proficient country in the world in terms of building these loitering munitions. Uh, what's interesting about them is that the, the drone, each drone has its own specialty. So think of the drone, you know, like buying a different type of motorcycle or a different type of car. There's different types. Let's talk about, for instance, the har harpies of the harps. Some of the drones are specifically designed so that they have what Israel excels in, by the way, is very good miniaturization and good technology, like a, what's called electro optics, which is the vision thing on the front, and also certain uh, other types of sensors. Because the name of the game in military technology these days is all about sensors. It's not about building the biggest, uh, biggest rocket. Actually, it's about precision guidance. It's about building the smallest, tiny little thing and having that thing find your enemy. So with the drone, it has a lot of sensors on it. Um, and, is, and by the way, the same sensors you put on that drone can be put on missiles or on planes for targeting pods. And by the way, Israel makes a whole plethora of this type of stuff. So sticking this little gadgets on a drone was just kind of log the logical next step. So what you do is you build the, the, the munition, which the drone itself is basically a munition on the front and some sort of propeller, and then sensors on the front as well to find the enemy. The drone is hunting around for a few hours. It finds a tank or something. And what I wanted to say was that certain types of the drones were used specifically to target air defense systems. That means that the drone hunts down the radar system, it sniffs it out, it finds the radar, and it just destroys it. And, in order, and, and the whole point of that is you just make your enemy totally blind. If anyone ever watched the movie Flight of the Intruder, which is about the U.S. and Vietnam, it's about, uh, I think, they're naval aviators. Um, they were, I think they were wild weasel, or they were flying these iron hand missions where the job of the aviator was basically during the Vietnam War, you, you know, they were doing a bombing campaign and you have air defense systems like SAM missiles, they're shooting at the missiles. You have to blind the system by destroying the radar so they can't find you. So that what the Americans were doing was flying in these planes to, to find and suppress the air defense. And the planes were actually luring the missiles up to bring them up so that other planes could hit them with these uh, strikes or missiles that hunt down these radar stations. So by the way, that's in the 19, uh, right, 60s and 70s. So the concept of what Israel's put in the bill has already, was already there. The Azerbaijanis bought a huge number of these drones. There's just a few videos online. There's like a rock music video where they put in the background a truck that had something like 36 pods on it to shoot drones out of because these types of drones, um, it's not a big drone like a Predator. You can you shoot it a bit like a bit like a kind of missile or a mounted missile. So you put you can have you could have layers of them and have them shoot out like a swarm if you wanted to. Um, so, because they're not that big. So they, they had a picture of all, and I think when they had that rock video, the Armenians just should have surrendered because man, if you're putting 36 drones in a rock video to show off what you got, you know, your enemy, your enemy better be studying it because this is not exactly clandestine. This is just, yeah, look what we have. So 
um, unfortunately, I think the Armenians didn't learn, didn't understand what was about to be thrown at them, uh, much like Saddam's army just didn't understand what was going to happen in 1990. And unfortunately, the Armenians, the Armenians did lose the conflict. But what it means for the Middle East and the world, I think, is that a smart the, the country that will win the future of wars will the smart countries will invest in this type of technology and buy it in mass because the problem with the American drone program is that there aren't that many Reaper drones. I think I was looking at congressional budgets or something or the budgets for the future. You know, we're talking about buying a handful of them a year because expensive products. Look, by the way, at the Global Hawk, which is America's premier uh, surveillance drone. It's an equivalent of like what used to be a U-2. You know, the Global Hawk look, costs $200 million. That's insane. How, if you lose one, <laughs> you, you can't afford any more of them. So the problem with the American defense procurement is everything costs too much. In Israel, if you look at what Israeli defense companies always say is, we'll give you more bang for the buck. It's, we give you the best technology and it's not that expensive. And loitering munitions are meant to be destroyed. So it's, as I said, not really a drone, more like a, more like a cruise missile. Cruise missiles are very expensive as well. But if you buy these types of drones and you use them smartly, let's say one layer destroys the enemy air defense, the next layer comes in and pounds the tanks, the next layer comes in and hits the artillery, and then all you have to do is pick off a bunch of soldiers and that's your war. And all an enemy can do is buy good air defense, which, by the way, Israel also makes. So if the Armenians had gotten in the game sooner, maybe they would have bought a lot of iron domes or something, because that is basically the only way that you'll be able to defend against a system like this, because um, it's difficult. And I think a, a smart country, if you throw enough drones at an air defense system, the air defense system can't handle them all. An air defense system only has a certain number of missiles. So if you fire 30 drones at a S S-300 or such system, how can the system stop it? Eventually, it'll be overwhelmed. And I'd say that that's the future of conflict. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that, by the way, from countries like China, which are building, you know, thousands of drones, as opposed to the United States, which is building like, no, no, let's build like five Rolls Royce drones. And the Chinese are like, no, 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 we'll just build a million Hondas and throw them at you. So I think it's, I think that's kind of where we're going, and we'll have to see. It's just like in 1940 with the French army versus the Germans. On paper, they look the same, but one of them won. So I think we will eventually see that conflict uh, develop. And that's why that, this conflict that just happened is really interesting and is worth learning about. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And before we get too far into any of the questions, can you just give us a rundown of how Turkey has also played a role in the drone production and, and so yes. like Azerbaijan? So Turkey? Turkey is interesting because Turkey is an example of a country that is, was a, uh, is ostensibly a NATO ally, was close to the West. But Turkey has, of course, drifted into becoming a much more extreme, aggressive, I think, generally anti-Western country. But in terms of military technology, we can just compare apples to apples. Turkey was unable to purchase, obviously, U.S. armed drones, and it was buying Israeli drones, but unarmed uh, drone, surveillance drones uh, about 20 years ago. And Turkey, I think, very intelligently said, wait a sec, you know what, we can make this ourselves. And they did. They, they built what's called the Bayraktar and a, a series of other drones. Bayraktar drones are not very fast. They carry just a few missiles. But the Turks were intelligent enough to say, wait a sec, you don't have to invest hundreds of millions in each one of these. Have them be cheap, put missiles on them. If they get shot down, fine. But if some of them will get through, and, all, and if you can chew up your enemy's tanks this way, you'll destroy your enemy. And... Um, so Turkey sold a lot of these drones, or some of them, to Azerbaijan. Turkey has used them, by the way, in Libya very effectively against Russian air defense. Once again, the name of the game is you build a better system or even a cheap system, but if you can mess up your enemy's air defense, uh, as we've seen in the history of the last 100 years of warfare, your enemy has a real problem. And I think that Turkey has successfully demonstrated that. That doesn't mean, by the way, you cannot build an air defense system that can destroy these Bayraktars. Turkish drones are really vulnerable. You just have to have a, ver a better air defense system that once been used against them. Or let's say in many cases, it's the air defender is incompetent. So in the case, by the way, I don't know about Armenians, but I mean, I think in many cases we've seen in Libyan places is that the air defenders just didn't use the system correctly. They didn't use the guns and the radar and the missile combinations. So, you know, part of air defense is just that you have to have the right guys or women or whoever trained to do it. So uh, Turkey, yeah, Turkey's played a big role there. And Turkey, by the way, I think, there's a big question then is whether or not Turkey will be able to supplant Israel as an arms supplier, Azerbaijan, as part of Turkey's global and regional ambitions as a military power. And I think that's something that should be 
paid very close attention to because Turkey, I think, has become certainly a problematic uh, actor and problematic member of NATO in that respect. Thank you. Along those lines, can you please assess the utility of Turkish drones against a more formidable, formidable enemy than the Armenian forces? Well, there's only a few other countries out there that make air defense systems. So, I mean, you'd have to say Israel, American air defense, or Russian air defense. So the evidence shows that Turkish drones in Syria and Libya were relatively effective against the, what's Russia's, what's called the Panjshir air defense system. And relatively effective. I think, again, that may go down to the problematic of how the people were using the system. So when you build air defense, you probably want to have an integrated air defense system with multiple layers like Israel has, which means, you know, you have something for high altitude, medium altitude, short, something for low altitude. You've got air defense that can deal with helicopters, drones, planes, or even against other missiles or whatever. So uh, in the cases where we saw with Turkey, I think it was generally that the Syrian Arab army or, or what happened in Libya is you just have a, one or two of these Panjshir air defense systems, which has a radar and has the missiles and the guns or whatever, but, and the, the Bayraktars were able to, for whatever reason, approach them in a way that the radars didn't see them or the missiles didn't work. And it seems to me that the problem may be that sometimes using electronic warfare or jamming or something allowed several of these drones to hunt down these machines. The problem is you need to have a bunch of these Panshears with S-300s and other things. Russia doesn't, Russia makes the right technology, but I think the problem with Russia is I don't think it supplies all of it correctly to its allies. So they're able to be picked apart. I mean, the question is, you know, would a Turkish, uh, would, you know, would a Turkish drone swarm, Turkish drones stand up against, you know, an I Israel's air defenses? I don't think so. So, but look at what Iran did, by the way, to Saudi Arabia in 2019. They attacked Abqaiq using cruise missiles uh, and drones. And by the way, Saudi Arabia had very good air defenses, but they didn't deploy them very well in Abqaiq. And I think the radars were facing the wrong way from what I understand. So, you know, I mean, you've got to have radar all around the site, 360 degrees, you've got to have several different systems. So it's more about integration. It's more about using the systems correctly, I think, than whether the systems exist. Turkish drones just aren't that, aren't that great. But the thing is, you don't have to have an F-35 of the drone warfare to do, to do the job because the job is, all I have to do is find a few of your air defense systems and hunt them down if you only have a few. So I think that's the kind of question. Um, certainly, you know, Turkey's drones can be, per, I think, relatively easily defeated. They could be shot down by other planes, for instance. The problem is Turkey just has used them in places where your t the, the enemies have been quite relatively weak. I mean, Haftar's army in Libya, which is supplied by the Egyptians and UAE, just didn't have a lot of uh, high-tech weaponry. And so it was a bit of a mismatch, which I think it's like, it's like I went back to the 1990s, Saddam versus the US. On paper, by the way, Saddam had air defenses. They just didn't work. I mean, so it's a question of technology. It's a question of who has the best ele electronic warfare devices, the best drones, the best air defense. And we haven't, we haven't really seen a conflict in which, you know, like, like Turkey is not fighting another NATO enemy. Like if Turkey went to war with Greece, then we'd see like an act, you know, we'd say, okay, here's two systems. How do they work together? But that's not what we're seeing yet. So it's hard to judge a bit. So which Middle Eastern countries do have that technology currently? Well, Israel has, you know, I just think the most sophisticated, uh, integrated, multi-layered air defense systems in the world, probably. But partly that's Israel's lucky because it's a small country. So it's easier to defend a kind of simple, small square and just, just kind of, you know, just festoon it with air defense. And inside it, you've got your F-35s and your F-16s and all sorts of different cruise missiles and every, you know, I mean, Israel's just a massive armed camp, you know, and I mean, Israel's a phenomenal country in that respect, you know, like uh, it's something, you know, it's, it's able to put in the field uh, an extremely competent uh, weaponry. And I think unlike, for instance, the United States or something, Israel doesn't have to deploy its forces thousands of miles from home. You know, the United States has a certain type of military um, capability that is unique because who else in the world is able to put, you know, a marine division in the field within 24 hours or whatever. I mean, and to have air defense there and stuff. But look what's happened with the United States. In Iraq, they didn't have defenses against uh, rockets. 100, uh, the Iranian militias in Iraq have used what's a 107 millimeter Katyusha rocket, which by the way is not new technology. That's technology from like the 50s or something. 
And they were able to use those rockets to harass American forces and bases. And you said to yourself, wait a sec, how come the most powerful country in the world doesn't have an air defense system at the base? Because they just never thought, yeah, okay, if I have to kit out all the bases with the CRAM or this, cause a certain type of uh, counter air defense type of system, how many am I gonna have to put in? Well, if I have eight bases and I gotta put three or four in each one, that's a lot of, that's a lot of air defense. So that's the challenge, I think. Um, Russia has a lot of air defense systems. Again, are they deployed usually the way they should be deployed, which is to have a whole bunch of them in one place. I think in um, northern Syria and Hamaimim Air Base, Russia does that. It has, it has a lot of ordnance there. So when they want to do it, they can do it correctly. And uh, so I would say, yeah, you know, I don't know what China is doing, but certainly Russia, the United States, Israel, and I guess several European countries should have the technology. Again, we don't get to usually see it all be tested the right way because it, because a country uses like uh, drones or cruise missiles like Iran they're not stupid. They just think, okay, I'll just choose a time and place to do this. If you're Saudi Arabia fighting, for instance, the Iranian backed Houthis in Yemen, and they use the Iranian drones, um, you know, Saudi Arabia is a huge country. How do you defend all of this when your radar, by the way, doesn't extend forever and your missiles can't, you know, missiles don't have an endless range. So when each air defense system, you know, is like a little circle on a map of here's what it can defend. You're like, oh, I have to put a lot of circles around this to defend this. So that's the kind of mathematical budgetary problem I think that countries face. Thank you. One last question on Turkey here. So Turkey is hurting economically. How much can its military industry help and how much of that Turkish technology is indigenous? Mm, well, I mean, it looks pretty impressive on paper. They're building their own missiles, precision guidance. They're building drones. I think they have electro, uh, what, what's it called? Electronic warfare things that they build. Um, I don't know. They're talking about building tanks and planes and all sorts of things. But, um, look, it looks impressive. And there's no reason that Turkey can't, can't build good military hardware. I mean, I mean, what, is Turkey uh, worse off than the Germans were in the 19, uh, late 20s and early 30s when they, when they took a, a total shambles of a country that had massive inflation and turned it within five or six years into the most powerful country in the world in terms of military equipment. I mean, why would Turkey be any different than Germany in 1928? I, I don't see why. It has, yeah, it has a budgetary problem. But you know, one thing, one thing that's good about an economic crisis is pouring money into a military industrial complex is probably not a bad way to go. And you can sell all that stuff and you can make a lot of money because military stuff makes money. People want it. And by the way, you know, a country like Turkey, because they're not really, even though they're a sensitive part of NATO, they don't really behave like a Western government in terms of, um, let's say, uh, checks and balances in terms of who they're selling it to. I mean, I think we're gonna, we'll, we'll see Bayraktars in Ukraine. We're gonna see them in, in Africa all over the place. We'll see them in Kazakhstan. It looks like there's a lot of buyers. And by the way, every time you have a war like Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan destroys its enemies, the, this, by the way, if you look at how Turkish talk, television talks about it and the companies, you know, they're just like, ching, ching, ching. They're just like showing pictures of the Bay Reactor every day. You see how it worked? And, um, you know, because they look at it as a sales point of view. America, by the way, doesn't do this with the predators. You know, America was always the opposite. The predator was really a, doing quite well in Afghanistan or whatever. And the American defense companies can't sell them. So it's like America, you know, America's a bit of the opposite. Like America doesn't sell F-22s or whatever, right? We sell F-35s. Um, so it's complicated. Israel is also very, is the same way about military equipment. Israel loves to brag about certain things like Iron Dome because it's cool. But when it comes to like the other things, controversial things like these, um, what they these loitering munitions, you'll see that Israel is very, very, very cautious about bragging. Like, oh, look at all the cool drones we have that kill people. No, Israel, Israel will say, no, 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 we make very good surveillance drones. And you're like, yeah, well, what, what, about, the, what about the loitering munitions? Not so much. So the Israel is very cautious about that because I think basically countries that are Western countries don't like to brag about building killing machines. They want it. They don't. I mean, it's just not cool anymore to do that. So, you know, they want to talk about defense. Air defense is fine, but not but not machines. So that, that I think will mean that Turkey certainly is going to be a player uh, in, in the future in terms of it looks like military sales. So just on a final closing note, what, what do you think this has, um, what implications, broader implications, do you think this has for, for warfare going forward? So I know you mentioned 
intelligent countries will invest in these drones and in, uh, in technology. But how do you foresee warfare taking place in the future? Well, I'd say there's two aspects to it. First of all, the, the technology of these types of loitering munitions and things give a country that is relatively not super wealthy the ability to have an instant air force which means instead of spending hundreds of millions of dollars on F-16s and F-35s, which by the way, most countries can't buy them anyway, because if you want to buy an F-35 from America, even if the Trump administration or the future administration says yes, it takes five years or so to get them. Who wants to wait five years? I mean, we want that. I want it now. So look, the nice thing about lawyer munitions, I think, uh, is if you can find a country that makes them, that's willing to sell them to you, you can probably have them in your country pretty quickly and I think they're pretty easy to use because what I understand about these, these weapon systems is you're basically talking about, you know, a computer, a tablet or whatever, uh, you know, and it's kind of user friendly. You just point and click. It's a bit like a video game, which, by the way, was always the critique of drone, war drone warfare was, yeah, but this is like video game killing. It's like, OK, well, that's just what it is. So, like, I think the technology is built almost to create an instant air force for countries. Now, imagine you're a country like, I don't know, Kuwait, and you have a lot of petrodollars. And you don't have a lot of F-16s and you can't train the pilots for them. By the way, that's another problem with Air Forces. You want to train an F-16 or an F-35 pilot, it takes years as well. That person is like one of your most elite people. So like, yeah, but wait a sec, a drone operator? No, it's a few week course. So why not buy a thousand of these dro uh, drones? Why not? What, what, are you, what are you gonna do? They're gonna, they're gonna go bad? I mean, so I just think it gives a country an ability to have an instant Air Force. The other thing that's, I think, interesting about it is it gives very powerful countries like the Chinese that are willing. I think China, unlike America, is not um, stuck in its ways in a sense. It doesn't have what's called like a silk scarf mentality in the Air Force of like all these, you know, uh, what, you know, like pilots like from the what's that movie of um, Top Gun, you know, like it doesn't have the romance of that. It's like, OK, we have an Air Force. Let's just build something that really will, will defeat our enemies. And China's willing to, I think, build in terms of um, quantity less than quality sometimes. So I think that manufacturing wise, they could potentially invest in what's called a drone swarm, which is like, you know, you build 10,000 of these things. And you know what, and a US aircraft carrier just cannot defend against a 1000 drones, it just can't. So like, I don't, you know, they may, they, may, they may be considering things like that, you know, using ballistic missiles and things to go after American carriers. And if you Google around, you look up, you know, China carrier killer, they're building things like that. And look, if you look at the history of the Second World War and you look at like the famous Battle of Midway or whatever, you know, it was a near, it was a near miss. It's a, it's a near run thing. If you only have five or six carriers, they can't be destroyed or you're, it's, it's kind of over. So like, I just think countries like China, if they're willing to innovate and invest massively in drones, it means that America and other countries better be investing massively in air defense. And by the way, the Americans are. America's building lasers nowadays to shoot down things like that. So we're going to see a new world. We may see soon a world that looks a bit more like Terminator um, using, and that's kind of cool. But the question is, right, weapon systems are interesting. What you need to wait, it's like the thing is you need to know what happens when they actually run into each other on the battlefield, right? Um, and I, so I always said, look at 1990 or 1941 with, or 40 with France. Look at these key points in history when two different weapon systems kind of suddenly ran into each other and they look, they both look great on paper, but three days into the war, you're like, oh no, wait a sec, one of these things just doesn't work. So I think unfortunately we'll see that day. And I think that smart Western militaries, if they're serious about confronting near peer adversaries like Russia or China, which America says it is, I think they need to be investing uh, in these types of things and investing in massive scale, which means, you know, America bought two Iron Dome batteries from, from the Israel, uh, for the US Army. Um, that's fine to play with them, but you know what? You don't want two, you need like, uh, 200 of them. So I just think in terms of scale, that's where, that's what countries need to think about. And they should be very thoughtful about their budgets and maybe not, maybe you don't need lots of F-35s. Maybe you need more smaller, uh, these types of weapon systems. All right. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today, Dr. Fransman. We, uh, unfortunately have come to the close of our webinar. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. I apologize again for the recording uh, due to the scheduling conflicts. Um, but for our viewers, please be on the lookout for our weekly webinar offerings email coming out over the weekend. Thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a great day.